I should also mention that um, Virgie and I would be glad to have some more people on the worship team. That drum set sitting back there is really wanting to be played. You heard it last Sunday, and so if you're online or you know somebody who plays drums, who uh, maybe has a love for the Lord and would like to come and play that drum set, it's a really pretty cool one, by the way. It's a pearl, which makes it, makes it uh, quite a jewel, okay? It's very <laughs> special. And so if you want to come... <laughs> sorry, wait, sorry. <laughs> But, but if you want to come play this drum set, we'd love to have you come. We'd love to have a, a, a bass player, right? A bass guitarist, right? Do, 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 do that extra beat to go along with the drum set. Or here, how about this? An, an electric guitar, which has the, you know, yeah, there you go. She's already, in, she already can hear it in her spirit, okay? And the, you know, it's got that real, you know, do different things like that. Uh, and then it, it sure would be nice if we had a couple other singers, right, Virgie? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then, and then we can have a synthesizer who joins her on the keyboard. Cool. So, so it would just really be fun. So I'm just saying is there's opportunity. It, you know, in fact, maybe be creative. Maybe you play a flute. Oh, that would be really cool. A violin, right? Or a cello, okay? Just, just think about it. And if you're online and you, and you would have that interest, we would invite you to be a part because God inhabits the praises of his people and we would love to have more praise occurring, uh, especially when uh, we're like this, just you and me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big stage. Yeah, we have room. <laughs> and, and we could all be spread out here. I mean, we have a whole orchestra. <laughs> Trumpets. There you go. Saxophones. There you go. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, right? So, so some of you need to go learn how to play an instrument. <laughs> All right. Just, just thought of you. This was one of the weeks I meant to invite because it was just Virgie and I up here today. And uh, it's not because we're trying to hog the stage. <laughs> By no means. <laughs> we don't have anyone to share it with us. So we're inviting. All right. There's the invitation. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And I thought just to, to, to help us get started with this, we need to realize that when we talk about blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, that the meek are not the weak, the timid, the, the, the pansies, the, the, the shy, the un, unwilling to do anything kind of people. And sometimes we've really misthought, misstated what meekness is. So, so let's look at some words that really match up with that. And, and, and even before we go there, may I remind you of something? That God says that he offers an incredible fruit of the Spirit, and that one of those fruit is meekness. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, that's the word being translated here, same word as meekness, gentleness and self-control. And by the way, I, I frankly even believe that self-control, you're going to hear it later, fits with meekness. It's a really important part of that. Now, notice, these are fruit of the Spirit. We get these because the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Right there, Paul's giving us a lot of instructions that relate to what it means to be meek and to and allow the Holy Spirit to work in us to be meek. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Humility and gen gentleness are synonymous terms for the word meekness. They go together. You, you can't be meek and not be humble. <laughs> gentleness goes along with that, and you'll even see how patience is a part of it as well. In 1 Peter, Peter said, Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet, quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. God wants to anoint us and empower us to become meek. And it's a spiritual fruit that comes with the spirit working in our lives. 
So Jesus says what? Blessed are the meek. My best description of meekness is anger, strength, power under control. Anger, strength, power under control. Moses was meek when he went to Pharaoh. How many times? With how many different plagues? And each time said, let my people go. He was meek when he went there. Moses was not meek when he took his rod and struck a rock and forced water out of it because he was angry with the children of Israel. In fact, that lack of meekness will make it so Moses doesn't even make it into the promised land. By the way, if you want to hear more about that story, talk to Paul Becker. He was reminding our life group about it yesterday. Numbers 12, verse 3 says, Moses, now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. <laughs> I should warn you that this, this statement is made when Aaron and his wife are about to say, we're more holy and righteous than Moses. How come he's got such an important place? And God says about Moses, in fact, the, the English Standard Version says this, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. David was meek. Even though he had all the, his own sins that he fell into, even though he was a military man, and, and because of that doesn't, build, rebuild, doesn't get the opportunity to build the temple, still, David was full of meekness. How many times... Did Saul try to kill him? And David chooses not to. How many opportunities did David have to, to actually strike Saul with his own sword? Remember the one time, especially inside the cave, and he'll come up and cut off a piece of the skirt of Saul and then hold it up and say, look, uh, I could have killed you. David had the ability and the strength and could have easily killed Saul right there, but he believed that under God's control, that God had placed Saul in as king, and it was not his responsibility to kill him. David operated with meekness. I found uh, one, one theologian, Matun, who says, Let, let's define what meekness is not. Meekness is not weakness, timidity, cowardice, <laughs> like this next one, flabbiness, a wishy-washy lack of conviction, being an introvert or being a sissy. <laughs> On the contrary, I never thought I'd hear the word sissy in, in a commentary. But <laughs> if, if you think meekness is weakness, try being, try being meek for a week. <laughs> meekness is not vindictive. Key, key word here. Meekness is not vindictive does not retaliate, is not selfish, does not emphasize its rights, does not exalt itself, and is not cruel and unkind. Sure sounds a lot like 1 Corinthians 13, doesn't that? <laughs> it is not being a hen-pecked husband or a brow-beaten wife. There, for those who thought I was going to miss somebody. It is not a yes man on the job. Meekness is not a passive acceptance of all the sinful acts and evil practices which unsafe men may try to enforce upon us in this world. Several theologians talk about the fact that these, how these, these beatitudes, these blessings follow one another. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And, and, the, and the key thing there is that we have to come to a place where we understand we need God. We're all poor in spirit, in front of God. Blessed are those who mourn. And remember what we touched on last week as we ended the message. To mourn means to actually grieve your sin. So you move from a place of, oh my, I, I have no rights to God, to then, Lord, I'm in trouble because I have sinned. And, and you really start to understand that you are a sinner that has no rights to get to heaven except because of Jesus. And because of that, then you become meek. Anger, strength, power under control. You humble yourself before God. The word for, uh, for meekness is, that the Greek word is prautes. 
which denotes the humble and gentle attitude which expresses itself in a patient submissiveness to offense. Here again, notice the next part of the definition. Free from malice and desire for re revenge. And as you go on in the definition about kratutes, it means to be submissive to God and his will. Barclay said, the man who is praus, the man who is meek, is the man who is always angry at the right time, never angry at the wrong time. Barclay goes on, and in fact, uh, in fact he has a, you know, he, he oftentimes will translate the scriptures in, in his commentaries, and he has an amplified version of the verse. He says, Oh, the bliss of the man who is always angry at the right time, never angry at the wrong time, who has every instinct and impulse and passion under control because he himself is God-controlled. There's another key phrase, isn't it? To be meek is not to be controlled by your own self-interest. To be meek is to be God-controlled. And then I should go back to Barclays and finish his. He says, who has the humility to realize his own ignorance and his own weakness. For such a man is a king among men. Well, obviously, when Jesus says, blessed are the meek, it's his way. Meekness is Jesus' way. Now think about that as I've mentioned that. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, if you, if most of you are farmers, right? And you have oxen, don't you? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> You're wishing for it, right? 77 acres of it, right? <laughs> well, Oxen, and, and we, we tend to use tractors now and stuff like that, but, but oxen, and what they used to do is they would take an older oxen and, then, and they'd take a yoke, and that's a wooden um, piece of material that would go across from one ox to the other so that they would work in tandem. So now you get more than double the power the, because you're using two oxen. Well, you'd take a younger ox and you'd put that next to the older ox because the older ox would teach the younger ox how to walk, how to, how to do the work, how to do it together, so that they both actually were able to do more because they were doing it together. And that's what Jesus is saying. And people in that day understood this. He's saying, look, if you will yoke yourself with me, I'll do the heavy lifting. I'll do the work. You, you, just, you, just, you just walk right beside me. You just connect yourself to me. And I'll give you what you need for us to get the job done. And, he's, and look how he says he's going to do that. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart. And Jesus is wanting us to learn how to be gentle and humble in heart. How to be meek. But let me give you an example of meekness that you might not think is meekness. <clears throat> When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, this is from John chapter 2, verse 13, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. By the way, you weren't supposed to take produce through the temple area. It's kind of like, you know, you really shouldn't be taking horses and cattle through the building here, right? And, in, and that's what they were doing. And worse than that, the, the stuff that they were supposed to sell away from outside the temple, they're selling in the temple area where people are supposed to be praying. Now, isn't that kind of fun? You get to pray with the noise of the cats and, the, excuse me, the cows and, the, well, actually, they would have been bulls. Uh, but the bulls and the lambs and the birds and the, hey, I've got, I've got them for two pence on mine are three pence and, and, and all that kind of going on out there. That wasn't supposed to be happening. People were supposed to be praying in this place. Well, let me continue verse 15. So he made a whip out of cords 
and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that is written, zeal for your house will consume me. And here's one of the reasons why I say that is an excellent example of meekness. Because meekness is not timidity. Meekness is not fear. Meekness is not being wimpy. Meekness is being angry at the right time. But having that anger under control. I dare you to get yourself extremely angry and then stop and knit. <laughs> Take out some cords. And, and you're when you're in your extreme anger, then just thread them together and form a whip and see how good your whip is. You see, Jesus had his anger under control. Jesus doesn't sin, though he's angry. He is consumed with protecting this place as a place of prayer. And so in his anger, he will cast these people out of the temple area. That is meekness, friends. Here's another example of meekness for Jesus. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. This is Matthew 26, verse 52. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Jesus is being arrested. Peter's taken out his sword. Jesus even said, hey, if you guys have your swords, bring them with. Oh, we got two. Peter, the, you know, the bright one, he's got one with him. And so they come up to arrest Jesus and he pulls out his sword and he cuts off Malchus's ear. And Jesus said, hold on there. I don't need that. This is anger, strength, power, totally under control. I have the ability to call forth 12 legions of angels, but I'm not going to do it because I'm here to accomplish God's will. This is Jesus being meek. Go on to Matthew 27, verse 39. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And can you imagine if that would be one of us? I am the son of God. What do you mean? Of course I am. And I could drink now destroy all of you. In fact, let me show you. I mean, wouldn't we kind of do something like that? And Jesus hangs there. into your hands. I come in my spirit. Come on, come down, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. You're the Messiah. You said you were. It is finished. The power created the universe, the power that displayed the stars in space, that set up the sun and the moon, the power that gave life to all of creation, hung there on the cross, and he could have used that power to destroy anyone. And instead, he'll use the power to destroy evil, to destroy sin and finish his job. Jesus, Jesus' way was the way of meekness. Kent Hughes reminds us that when it came to matters of faith and the welfare of others, Jesus was a lion. Think of it, how did he react? When the Pharisees got all upset because he healed a withered man's hand on the Sabbath. And how did he do it? He just said, stretch out your hand. 
He didn't even walk anywhere. So how did he break the Sabbath? Oh, he said, stretch out your hand. But he became upset. He was angry when his own disciples tried to prevent little children from coming to, into his presence. He says, no, no, the kingdom of heaven belongs to one such as these. Come on, children. He got pretty upset with Peter after he'd already made this great declaration. And then Peter tries to say, you're not going to Jerusalem. I'm not going to let you die there. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You see, Jesus, when it, when it came to people, in the will of God, he wasn't timid. John MacArthur says the idea of a meek Messiah leading meek people was far from any of their concepts of the Messianic kingdom. The Jews understood military power and miracle power. They even understood the power of compromise, unpopular as it was. But they did not understand the power of of meekness. God has that sirens going in the background. You know somebody's in need. Somebody's in crisis. Somebody may be hurting, even dying. Lord, get the firefighters and emergency personnel there quickly and may that person or people who are in crisis feel your presence and know that you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. Bark, Barclay reminds us that one of the great maybe illustrations of what it means to be meek is like the, do the ferocious dog. Our, our Brody used to be this way. Uh, we, we liked the noise that he would make. I mean, was, uh, his, his bark was terrible. And in fact, I'd, I'd play with Brody, and, and he'd, we'd be playing and tugging with someone, and you'd think he was going to tear me apart. But he never did. Meekness is like that ferocious dog that sounds terrible to the stranger, but loves and plays with the family. I find another example of meekness. It's a story we've talked about before. It's a movie some of you have seen. It is a movie with a lot of blood in it and with a lot of language. And the movie is called Hacksaw Ridge. It's a movie that tells the story in some creative ways, but tells the story of Private Desmond Doss, a Seventh-day Adventist who does not believe that he should carry a gun, but yet wants to serve his country. And so he wants to go into the army, into the military, and serve as a medic. Yet he refuses to carry a gun. He's nearly court-martialed because of that. He's beat up because of it. He's called a coward because of it. He's threatened even with, with not just only jail, but they're about to kill him. But Doss perseveres, wins his fight to become a medic, to go into battle, as the one general says, to go into the hell of the battlefield without a single weapon to protect him. Doss, as some of you remember the story, on Okinawa, Hacksaw Ridge was about this 400 foot cliff that the American soldiers had to climb. And as they got to the top, artillery and things started attacking, and 75 of them got wounded almost immediately. Doss remains up on, on the top of the ridge and through the night lowers 75 men down that wall with his own hands, with ropes. It's an incredible, incredible story. And the next day, in fact, the, the, in the true story of, of, of Doss, he will go back on the battlefield five more days. He'll get wounded. While he's being wounded and he's on a stretcher, he sees another man who's in worse place than him. He crawls off the stretcher and he has them put that man on and he stays there with the artillery still hitting, striking the ground. He will rescue people. He'll go within 25 feet of the enemy to rescue four different soldiers. And he does this for the next five, six days. 
So when he's wounded in his leg and then ultimately gets hit again and now his, his, his arm, the bones are crushed in it. Watch this clip if we, if we can. Okay, something's wrong with the sound. You can keep it going, but um, but what, this is his, um, I believe, sergeant. That I'm not sure I remember. And if somebody can see his insignias, you'll know uh, who's coming to him. And he, and he, as he comes up to him, he says, um, "Doss, I didn't understand. I didn't understand who you were." You're getting it. Much louder. And maybe restart it then, okay, Jonathan, please. But turn the volume even up more if you can. More, please. Let's, let's stop. So as he, in, in the movie there, as he is saying that, he's saying, okay, um, I'm sorry, and I hope that someday you'll be able to forgive me. And I understand if you can't. I just didn't know who you were. And this sergeant is starting to recognize that this man without a gun was a great, incredible hero. But we're the Medal of Honor, the president, is it Truman, I believe, that gives him his award, says, I would rather have wear this award than be president of the United States. And as he ends that clip, the sergeant saying, um, Doss, I know you went through hell, but the men believe that you've got something special and they want a piece of that. And they're not going to go back up onto the ridge unless you go with them. And he asked Doss to go back up. And I love the clip in the movie. And again, it's got some of that cool language, right? <laughs> Remember, these are soldiers. And uh, you have the, there's the clip where the um, sergeant's there on, on the walkie-talkie or whatever it is, uh, the radio. And his commander is saying, why haven't you gone up the mountain yet? And, and his response is, uh, uh, we're waiting for Private Doss. <laughs> Why blank? Or who the blank is Private Doss? Uh, sir, <laughs> he's praying. <laughs> and the men are waiting for him to pray. Incidentally, true story. That last day when Doss is wounded, he's been carrying a Bible that his, that his wife gave to him at, for their wedding. And that's the Bible he's been reading. He's been carrying it everywhere he's at. In fact, that you saw in that clip, he was reading that Bible. Well, that last day when he was wounded, he lost his Bible. He's out, I believe, on a ship or something like that. They're getting ready to take you. And, and he says, he goes to reach for his Bible and realizes he doesn't have it. He asks, he asks the orderlies, please communicate with my guys. My Bible is back on the ridge. And those men will go and hunt and find that Bible to give back to him. This is a man who was meek. Could have fought back when they tried to, when they beat him up, could have done all kinds of things, but he didn't. Because he had his anger, his strength his power under control. What did Jesus say? Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. I read Psalm 37 earlier 
in which it said, verse 8, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. And you all know when you get out of control, when you're angry, when you're upset, it'll lead to some form of sin. Verse 11, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. This is the very verse that Jesus is quoting as he's saying, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Again, in verse 22, those the Lord blesses will inherit the land, but those he curses will be destroyed. Verse 29, the righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Verse 34, hope in the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are destroyed, you will see it. Jesus promises for those of us who are meek, who have learned to be under the power of the Spirit of God, that we will inherit the land. <laughs> Martin DeHaan in The Daily Bread, and incidentally, if you're here today, uh, there are new daily breads there. In fact, they started in September. Some of you need to go ahead and pick one up and continue reading on. But in, in one of the Daily Bread articles, he talks about Bill Farmer's newspaper column. J. Upton Dixon was a fun-loving fellow who said he was writing a book entitled Cower Power. He also founded a group for submissive people and called it Doormats. <laughs> Doormats stands for Dependent Organization of Really Meek and Timid Souls if there are no objections. <laughs> Their motto was, the meek shall inherit the earth, if that's okay with everybody. <laughs> and their symbol was the traffic yellow light. <laughs> <laughs> A number of theologians also point out that meekness is much like the relationship between a horse and the rider. <laughs> what rider could lift a horse? <laughs> What rider could, could really control a horse unless the horse was willing to be controlled? But the rider can control a powerful horse that's eight times their size. A little person, even a child, can control a horse. That's meekness. And for us, what we need to learn to do is to put ourselves under the control of the Spirit of God like that horse puts itself under the control of the rider. I do have another example of meekness. It's found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and following. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether we fed, well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. That is meekness, being controlled by God and content with whatever you have. So as I wrap up today, just a few questions. The main one is this. Are you meek? Are you meek? Do you have your anger, your strength, your power under control? Do you get mad at the right things? Folks, there's things happening in our land that we should be getting mad about. Yesterday, there was a whole uh, workshop all day long online that was uh, put on by pastors and government and all kinds of leaders and all. And one of the ladies that came on there was talking about the various bills that are being passed and have been passed within our state. And she said, we need to be getting angry. We need to be doing something about this. We need to be speaking up. There are various reasons why 40% of Christians in America are not even registered to vote. That means almost half of evangelicals are not even registered to vote. Some of that, I understand, some of that's their, their personal theology that says, you know, we're going to just trust God and so we're not going to get involved in the process. 
But for others, it's just plain irresponsible. We're simply not doing it. It's one of the ways that we have to change our world, and that is to vote. We need to get angry about the right things. Do we get angry about the millions of babies that are aborted? Innocent children who have no choice in life at all. It is the most vulnerable place for any human being today. A mother's womb. Do we get angry about the right things? Are you content with your life? Are, are you able to say, thank you God for what I have? Are you able to just enjoy what he's, what he's given to you? See, that's what the person who's, who's blessed with meekness and who's inheriting the land can, can walk outside and say, this is just beautiful here. What, what a blessing we have to, to even live in this place, to enjoy this place, to even enjoy this land, even enjoy this country. What, what treasures we have because we are here. Are we content with what we have? But here's an important question. How well do you submit to the will of God? Would you say that you're actually obedient to the Lord as much as he would want you to be obedient? See, Followers of Jesus Christ who have surrendered to him, who have committed their lives to him, are happy because they do what he wants. Are you meek? Jesus, you know the truth. You know whether our our anger, our strength, our power, our abilities it is under your control. You, you know if we're really being obedient to you. Are we going into the world to make disciples, even at a time when governments told us we're not to have contact, but, but hey, with a mask on, we can go much closer. Are we doing it? Are we obeying what Jesus says? Are we taking and making those divine appointments and, and recognizing them? Are we praying? Are, are, we, are we having a say in our land? Are we speaking up about truth? Are we doing your will? God, you want to bless us. I pray that your spirit would teach us to be meek. And I understand, God, that if we haven't really accepted you, if we haven't really committed our life to you, if, if as you said to Nicodemus, we're not born again, that we will not have new life and we probably won't do very well at this meekness thing. Oh, Jesus, come into our lives. Fill us with your spirit and help us to be a blessing. In Jesus' name.